Exodus. That's all right. I gave. I guess we gave him permission, so there. They took the. Took the opportunity. No, that's great. Good to see a lot of kids go down, and good to see a lot of your smiling faces still here. So that's excellent. All right. Wow. God's faithfulness. What a great thing. I might have messed up today by wearing a sweater. I was really cold this morning, but it might be messing with the microphone, so apologies in advance if there's a lot more of those little scuffs and things. But can you all hear me okay? It is picking my voice up. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Well, man, I just got to keep reveling. That's one of the nice things about being over there during the song time. I get to sing, and nobody needs to look at me and worry about what I look like. But now I got to take a second from the songs. Um, I know we picked them. I picked them on purpose because they have to do with what we're preaching on, and yet um, something about singing God's word as well as hearing it that's really just a great thing. So um, we are going to be talking about God's faithfulness. Um, and I'm excited to get into Christmas. So um, let's pray, and then let's jump right in. And then, um, again, one last quick announcement. If you're not a member of church, you're welcome to stay for the church meeting. It's good to, you're not going to vote to approve the budget or whatever, but hearing what's going on, there is a lot of stuff going on. Um, in, so please feel free. It's going to be, as much as he says, it's going to be fast. By the time everybody leaves and we get started, um, you'll all still be able to make lunches. So Feel free to stay and find out what's going on with the church and um, just some of the the behind-the-scenes stuff will be good. Um, Let's pray before we jump into God's Word. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the bright sun, the beautiful snow, uh, even warm homes, um, and just your health and that you've given us so many gifts that we could just be listing them and we could just spend the day doing that, God, um, if we really paid attention. You've been doing so many good things for us, continually blessing us. Um, We want to just have an attitude and be people who recognize your goodness to us. I pray this morning just for this word, um, for for us as we look at your word, that we look at the theme and the talk of promises, God. I pray that we would trust your promises, that we would um, believe that you are keeping your promises, uh, know that you keep your promises for your good, for your glory and our good. And so um, as we get in this morning, help us to to see that and to pray that your Holy Spirit would even just be speaking through my words and through what I'm prepared to, what you want us to to take away. I pray this in your name. Amen. All right. So I want to start this morning. Uh, You can can open up your Bibles if you'd like to Genesis. We're going to probably be there for the most part. Um, Genesis 12. We're going to be bouncing around a bit because I'm trying something a little new, a little different. And we've been finishing, we finally finished the book of Ephesians. Some of you might be really glad of that. Um, That was really kind of an easy way to preach because each week you just pick a piece of scripture and just see what it says and you observe and see, you kind of dig into it and see what God says in that. And you get to kind of extract all this beautiful truth. Um, This morning, I've been thinking about Christmas. I can't get it off my mind. I think a lot of us are. I am like a little kid. It's like a month away, and yet I'm like, I'm jumping. And yet I'm thinking Christmas Day. Okay, there's Christmas passages that we're all really familiar with, and the Christmas story. And yet, I've been thinking about it, because the Christmas, Jesus coming at Christmas is an amazing thing, and, and it's great to look forward to and anticipate. And yet, there's this really important thing about backstory, there's the, if you just kind of, on its own, it's a great thing, but backstory helps a lot. And it was reminding me <clears throat> of the importance of backstory. So there's a movie that, shockingly, to me at least, uh, is turning 20 years old this year. Um, and I hope I'm not the only person who talks about 20-year-old movies. Okay, but Lord of the Rings movie came out 20 years ago. Do you guys know this? Are you in the age group? Okay, so Lord of the Rings have been around for, you know, about 60 years or so. But, and they just made a new one, which is kind of, they're kind of keeping it alive, so people, it's still on people's radar. But okay, 20 years old, um, I'm not going to lose most of you. If you're not a fan, don't worry. It's not just about my geeky movie preferences. Um, but if you were like me in my, I think it was 20, 2003, uh, Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King was actually all the rage. I don't know if you can think back 18 years ago, 19, gosh. Okay, but... In this movie, again, the time was just the time. 
But there's, in this movie, there's this great scene. At the end of the movie, this big battle scene. And this guy, Aragon, comes, arrives on the scene in the middle of the battle scene to help the city of Gondor to defeat the enemy, right? The Sauron, the ruler, the guy with the ring. Okay, and it's this great scene. It shows up, and in the time of 2003, it was very high-tech uh, uh, CGI stuff. But it's this great scene, very exciting, him coming to save the day. If you had just dropped in on that point of the movie. Okay, if you've never watched any of it, if you've never watched any books, if you never just watched that movie for once, people will be like, yeah, this is cool, that was neat. And yet, that scene that everybody cheered at at the movie theater, it was the culmination of this whole story. And so by the time you got to that scene, if you had been invested and paying attention, you'd already watched right, two and a half, three hour movies. So you've already watched about eight hours of film dedicated to this story. Um, you've learned, and you probably, like me and my geek friends, had gone back and read the books. And so you read all the history of Middle Earth. And you know that this guy, Aragon, he's not just this hero of the moment, but he's the rightful king of that city. He's been in exile for all these years, and he's battled these terrific odds to finally come and claim his throne, right? And to get this pretty cool scene. And so people, I remember this in 2003, people were cheering at scenes. Again, not just geeky fantasy people, but like normal people were cheering at this fantasy movie in 2003. There's a lot of other context as well, I, um, but um, knowing that backstory, that's what I was thinking, the history that arrival, that hero on the scene makes that much more sense, means that much more. And so, as we're thinking about it, Christmas, as I'm anticipating it and looking forward to it, is this great event and cause for celebration even if we don't know all the backstory, right? Um, if you just read Luke 2, which we do every Christmas morning, right? Luke 2, a child is born, angels announce his birth, um, amazing things are said of him, right? It's a really cool thing. And yet, if knowing the backstory, the history sheds light on this event and really, I think, hopefully helps us to appreciate it all the more. Okay, so I want us to see this season. We're going to spend about four weeks on it. Jesus' birth, while amazing on its own, is part of the grand story of God working through history. It's this grand story. It's it's a great thing in that moment, but if we just see it in that moment, we might, 2,000 years later, just be like, well, that was a cool thing that happened in history. But if we kind of recognize, no, hold on a second, it's the culmination of thousands of years of promise making before that, then that moment applies and continues for the thousands of years afterwards. It's, it's, we need to see the big picture that God's working throughout all of history. And so... Um, it's just a neat thing for us to be thinking about. We're here today because God made promises long ago. He fulfilled those promises in Jesus' life, and we benefit those promises through faith from those promises. So it's this cool pattern. I was trying to think. So I'm looking at Christmas, but I'm also looking back. So um, as I was trying to figure this out, saying, well, hold on. The whole Bible points to Jesus. That's cool. Okay. So how am I going to preach the whole Bible in a few Sundays, moving on and explaining Jesus? But um, as I was doing some homework, to trying to figure this out, there is a pretty cool pattern um, that if we look at, and we're going to look at these next four weeks, that will help us to appreciate this backstory. It's this pattern um, where God in the Old Testament, so here's the pattern. God in the Old Testament makes promises to people in the form of a covenant. If you've heard covenants, we sing about a covenant. We talk, there's Bible verses about God's covenants. Okay? He makes promises in the form of a covenant to an Old, per, Old Testament person. Uh, when I think of a covenant, I just want you to think of an agreement, okay? a contract, a promise. Those are words that I want you to think of when you think of a covenant. Okay? And this, there's this long history of God making promises to his people and those people sometimes failing in the keeping up their end of the deal. But God, whether or not they trust him, God is, is working in those covenant, those promises. So he makes a prominent promise to the people. Then at Christmas, there's these glimpses of the covenant 
in Jesus' birth. He kind of touches on them. There's, there's things that if you're reading the Bible, the, the Christmas story, that just kind of references random, seemingly random people. Why is Abraham and Jacob and Isaac talked about during Jesus' birth, right? You know, there's these glimpses of the covenants in Jesus' birth. It's showing that God's keeping those promises in Jesus' life. So in the Gospels, Jesus' life, we see this small recognition, maybe not by everyone, but by a few, that the promises of God that he made to their forefathers are being brought about, they're being kept in Jesus. Okay, and then after Jesus' death, so that's the first thing is God makes a promise. Then the second, Jesus' birth, there's these, um, God is keeping his promise in Jesus' birth. And then thirdly, after Jesus' death and resurrection, continuing through today, God connects those promises to his church. So there's this covenant that just continually goes through. He connects those promises to his church. They're recognized by those who accept Jesus, who receive his gift of grace. And so just to summarize, if we want to just go really simply, the pattern goes like this. God makes a promise in the Old Testament covenant. He then keeps the covenant promise in Christ's birth. And now he connects the covenant promise to his church. So there's this pattern that, that goes along that I'm going to look at because I, I was like, I got it. the covenants are really rich. They're really important. And yet, sometimes it just seems like a random history thing. So God makes promises, he keeps them, and then he connects them to his church. And we're going to look starting with the first covenant. Well, not the first. There's about five that are really touched on. Um, my favorite, I guess. <laughs> and it's the covenant he made with Abraham. Okay, The covenant, it may not seem very Christmassy, but knowing this bit of backstory, it really helps us to appreciate Jesus' birth. Um, before he was born, before prophets gave hints about his birth, before there were kings of Israel, before judges ruled, these are all things that happened, before even Moses gave the law, right, that's a big deal, before any of that, God was at work and he started to build a people for his glory with this man named Abram. Okay, so we're going to look just a little bit at the promises that he made to Abram first. Okay, and it begins in chapter, in Genesis 12. So if you have your Bible, if you've been waiting to get to it, here we are. Genesis 12, 1 through 3. So all we really know about Abram at this point is that there's a couple verses about him and his family and where they're from. But basically he had two siblings. He had a wife who was unable to have children. And they were travelers. That was pretty typical stuff. And yet, God makes it very clear that he has plans, specific plans for this man, Abram. Okay. It's really actually an amazing thing that God even decides to interact with Abram. To say God makes covenants with people. We could just pause there and just say, why? Why would God even interact with people? The amazing thing is he does. So that he does, it's an incredible thing we should be grateful for. And... Um, and look at what it teaches us about God. So Genesis 12, 1 through 3. I'm going to read real quick if you want to read along. Okay. It starts there and it says, The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. God comes back to this covenant multiple times. If you want to flip two or three pages down uh, to Genesis 17, 1, there's a continuation of that. This is probably about 20 years later. We're not exactly sure how old Abram was at the first time, but we know at this point when Abram was 99 years old, okay, Genesis 17, 1, when he was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abraham fell face down and God said to him, for me, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. 
Your name will be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. And then verse 7 is really cool. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come, to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan, where you now reside as a foreigner, I would give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. Okay? Um, so there's an amazing thing that he continually makes this promise to Abram, changes his name to Abraham, and just interesting enough, to change someone's name, God's all about changing names. A name is your identity, right? Who you are. He's changing Abraham, Abram, not just in name, but in who he is as he's changing him and making these promises to him to make him not just this guy, but the father of a nation. So there's a few observations that we can take from this, from the nature of the covenant that God makes from Abraham. And I think we should look at those, just kind of summarize what those promises, what these covenants are. Um, so a few parts of that promise is, the first thing, many descendants. Okay, this is sort of a, seems kind of strange or interesting, but it says to literally make a many uh, offspring of Abraham. Now, this is unique if you know the story of Abraham because, right, he was, his wife was barren and he was old. So that promise right there seemed like God was starting kind of handicapped or <laughs> kind of like, here, I'm going to show you, I'm going to start with something just to prove that this is not just, you know, circumstance. I'm really going to make something from you. So he promises him children. And literally from that, to make a great nation of him. Being fruitful was part of that, having many descendants, but beyond just the many descendants coming from him, a great nation, um, there's many pieces to accomplish there, right? Verse 6 um, there, verse 6 of seven, chapter 17 says, right, um, he would be the father of this great nation. Kings would come from them. God would bless that kingdom. So it's not just lots and lots of grandchildren, which would be awesome in itself for Abram. But to then say that the grandchildren are going to be a people that I lift up, a nation that is going to, I'm going to point to that nation as my people. Okay. And then the next part that is just a fantastic, to bless all the nations of the world through Abraham and his offspring. Okay. To make a great nation and then use him to bless all the nations of the earth. Those are kind of the two main ideas, the two main pieces of that covenant. There's a lot of other things, right? Giving him a land of Canaan, um, that it would be an everlasting kingdom is pretty amazing. It's incredible that the promise was made to an old man. Again, an old man and his barren wife, um, he gives it to them. And I kind of wonder a little bit if Abraham even considered whether or not to agree to this covenant. A covenant, right, is a promise. It's kind of an agreement. It's initiated by God, but I would think that Abraham might think, this isn't going to come to anything. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to, okay, I'm, I'm hearing from God somehow, or maybe in, in a vision of some sort, right, or, or God's spoken word. But even that, after some time goes by, maybe he says, hold on a second, I think I heard from God. I heard from God, for sure. He spoke to me. He said, gave me this promise. But then after some time goes by, does he, does he say, maybe I was just confused. Maybe I was having a bad dream. Maybe it was, right? So Abraham might have, he had a choice in that point of, make, of agreeing and following God's commands and, and being part of this. And yet, whether or not to go with it, the Bible does say, though, that, that, that Abraham believed God. Uh, Galatians 6, it was uh, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. That's the start of it. So one of the reasons why I think Abraham believed God is because even in small amounts, he understood and he recognized the nature of the covenant maker of God. The way that God makes his covenant, it shows us some of his character. First, 
his, his character, right? His character is grace-based, not merit-based. It says he came to Abram. Abraham had nothing to offer for God to make a covenant and to pick him to work through, okay? Um, it was not based on anything of Abram's worthiness, okay? I know I like, and we think about a lot, we like merit-based awards, right? A lot of us have complained nowadays about, you know, participation trophies for everybody, right? We don't like it because it's like, no, you got to earn your keep. You got to earn that reward and that recognition, right? We like to earn things, and there's a, there's a point to that, right? You don't want to just, and yet, you don't want to just give away things for free, right? However, we like hard work rewarded, but, but Abraham did not pass a test in order for God to choose him, in order for him to be the person that God picked to work through. Um, he did not do anything special for God to enter in a covenant relationship with him. That's an amazing thing that talks about God's grace. It's God's grace that, and his love for people that makes him, that makes us think about us. We don't impress God, right? So, and yet, God still looks down on us with just great pride and love, and it's an amazing thing. So, also, it's a one-sided covenant. Okay, the covenant is God-initiated, is God-dependent, and that being said, it can't be thwarted by Abram's, Abraham's weaknesses. Throughout the rest of the story of Abraham, you see that Abraham fails to meet God's faithfulness. He, he fails to obey God. God says, do this, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow me. I'm going to obey me, and I will take care of you. I will fulfill you. I'll make you into a great nation. First thing he does, right, he says, okay, well, God's going to make me into a great nation, but I can't. We can't have kids, so I guess I'm going to just have to figure out another way, my own way, to, to, to God's, right, to fulfill God's promise. And God says, no, 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 it's with your wife, Abra, or Sarah, right? So even after Abram fails God and, and doesn't trust him in, in his walk, he might fail. Even after that, God continues and recommits to the covenant. God says, okay, you know what? I'm still here, I'm still promising, I'm still going to work with you, I'm still going to make you into a great nation. And so it's a great thing to see that God uh, reminds him that he's not going anywhere. Abraham may fail, God won't. Okay? That's something for us to take great, great encouragement in. We may fail God in our obedience to him, but he doesn't. He makes a promise, he keeps it. That's a great thing for us. Um, the third thing about this and about the covenant, it is faith dependent. Abraham is tasked to obey, right? Human failure is recognized, but God's grace and his faith, it, it's on us to, it, it's taken into by us through faith. That's the big idea there. So God makes this covenant in the Old Testament. It's not just kept, but then in the Christmas story, so that's the covenant to Abraham. It's given it's held on to. And what happens is God does make a great nation of Abraham. Abraham becomes the father of the people of Israel, um, the Jewish nation. They have a long and interesting history with God in their obedience to him and their following and not. And yet they continually recognize God made this promise to Abraham. He, we are his chosen people, right? And so at the time of Jesus' birth, they're waiting and still looking to God's covenant to Abraham, a nation that God blesses, a great nation that God blesses and that God will bless other nations with. Okay? And so then the next piece, that this pattern goes, God keeps that covenant promise to Abram. He keeps it with Christ's birth. Christmas is not just this one-time unique event, but it's a culmination of God's continued faithful promise and his promise-keeping ways. So in the Christmas narrative, there's these small hints of that those who are there, they recognize that God's promises to Abraham were being kept. So I was looking at this, and I thought, man, it's interesting when you can look at it yourself, and just look for 
mentions, if you do this on your own in your Christmas season, this season, as you're reading verses about Christmas, right, uh, in Luke, in Matthew, look for references to Abraham. He doesn't seem to fit, and yet he's in all these little verses. And, and when Mary hears about being pregnant, she sings this amazing song, and she talks about God's faithfulness to Abraham. And it's like, why is he talking about that? I, 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 thought, I, I always thought that was kind of strange, but even then she recognized God's faithfulness to him, to the people for that whole time, is being recognized with this child. So I'm going to just focus on one of those, and this is in an interaction with a man named Simeon. If you'd like to turn in your Bibles, it's Luke 2, verses 25. So I'll give you a couple of seconds there. But in this Christmas narrative, there are these hints that those people were recognizing God's promises to Abraham. And so, um, again, this promise of Abraham's descendants being a great nation and a blessing to the world through Abraham is part of that covenant. And so this man, Simeon, is talked about in the book of Luke. So this is after Christmas, but about 10 days after Christmas, right? The actual birth of Christ. Um, Jesus was born, but it's one of those few passages that talks about Jesus as a baby. And it's here in Luke 2.22, I'll start. It says, they take him to the temple to be to do the purification, to be circumcised, different things like that. Okay, So when the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him, Jesus, the infant, to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord. Consecrated, just set apart, dedicated to the Lord. Say, this is your child, really. And then they offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now, here's where Simeon comes in. There was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And you can read into that, the consolation of Israel, what would that be? Well, that's the time when Israel, the nation, would again be a great nation that God had promised Abraham, right? God had made them a great nation at the current time when Jesus was born. They're not super powerful and amazing anymore. They're under Roman rule. So he's waiting for that consolation of Israel. The Holy Spirit was on him, verse 26. It had been revealed to him that by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts, and when the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, and this is where it's really good. Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. I can die now. I, here's why. My eyes have seen your salvation, which you've prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Okay, this song of his, I think, points, has to point to the promise to Abraham of the nation of Israel. And yet Jesus is not just, okay, he had to be recognizing the promise to Abraham. All the nations would be blessed through Abraham. And what is Simeon saying about Jesus? He recognizes through the Holy Spirit's showing him, the Holy Spirit's showing him this baby is what, verse 32, a light of revelation to the Gentiles. Who are the Gentiles? The whole world, non-Jews, right? Jesus is that blessing that through Abraham, all the nations of the world would be blessed. Jesus is the blessing for all the nations, a light of revelation to the Gentiles. It's that fulfillment of the great nation. Abraham's physical descendants were numerous. They are numerous and impressive. And yet, more impressive than that is the spiritual descendants that Jesus has. That's a greater fulfillment than that ethnic group, right? A nation is a great thing, but the spiritual nation that Jesus has built and is building is a greater thing. That's what was promised to Abraham, a great nation. He didn't recognize it was going to be more than just a people group. 
but this nation of God's family. So through Jesus, a great nation was formed, a people that will that would honor God forever, not a physically connected people, but people who are adopted by God. So it's the ultimate promise kept, one that came from the nation, from Abraham through that promise, but provides the way for all people of the earth to be blessed. And what is the way that Jesus, knowing him, all the people of the earth can be blessed? It's by faith in him. So this pattern, God made this covenant to, in the Old Testament. He kept that promise with Jesus' birth. And then we see that God connects that covenant promise, not just to those people right then who recognized it, right, Simeon, but he keeps that promise to the church. From Jesus' death and resurrection until today, God's promises are continually still being fulfilled. And now, not just to the nation of Israel, they are being fulfilled to his church, to the nation who has accepted his free gift of adoption, his gift of salvation. His promises weren't just for the people of the Bible. Sometimes we see it that way, right? It's just those guys we think it's really important. He connects them to even us, us even today. So we should be thankful for it. The promises kept and connected to God's church, those who believe. Okay, so what was, the, again, the promise that God gave Abraham? Well, again, it's a great nation, and from that nation, all the people of the earth would be blessed. Right? That's, I want us to kind of take that in mind. If we think Abraham's covenant, all the people of the earth will be blessed. Right? A great nation. All the nations of the world would be blessed. And yet we see the connection made by God's people to the church. Okay? So there's two passages about that that I want us to look at because one of them talks in real time when Peter and John explain it, I think, really well. And then one of them is to the church as people are getting saved. So real quick, we'll do those two and then we'll just appreciate it. So it says, Peter and John in Acts 3, 25 and 26. They, Jesus, again, it's not just this baby born, but it's what he's done, right? So Acts 3, 25 26, um, Peter and John are out. Jesus has been, he's lived with them. He died. He was raised. All the great things that we go through, right? He's been um, ascended to heaven. The disciples are now living in the Holy Spirit, and they're telling people about him. So they're healed a beggar, and they're pointing people to Jesus as the one who was really the one who healed this beggar, who did this. They're talking about, they go back to Abraham, to these people who recognize Abraham as their spiritual ancestor forefathers. And they go back and remind them of the promise God made to him. Okay? So explaining again this healing and explaining how it connects to Jesus, Peter and John, for some reason, interestingly, talk about Abram. And they say this, Acts 3.26, it says, You, you Jewish people, you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, through your offspring, all peoples of the world will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. So he says, look, through Abram, all the people of the earth will be blessed. And then that last verse in 26 says, when God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you. Who is the servant who God raised up? That they're, He's pointing them to. He's pointing them to Jesus. He's saying, look, when God raised up Jesus, he sent him first to you. The blessing that God has promised to Abram, it is Jesus. He sent him first to you to bless you by turning you from your wicked ways, right? Repentance is one of the first steps in turning to accepting Christ. It's recognizing that you're going in the wrong direction. And so to say that, God promised all the nations would be blessed through Abraham's offspring. And that offspring, that one that will bless all the nations, that is Jesus. Jesus is the one that you've got to put your faith in. And so right then in real action, that's their first evangelism saying, look, the promises to Abraham are fulfilled in Jesus. Jesus is the one to do it. And then the second piece, so it's cool to see them do it in real time. And then later, 
Apostle Paul recognizes this connection and wants to make sure those promises of Abraham, we, the early Christians, saw that. And so Galatians 3 goes and says that too. I know I've covered a lot, but Galatians 3 is one more passage. It's so good about Abraham's real DNA. What, again, do we connect? Why are we connected to Abraham? What makes him important? Is it because of the nationality thing? Is it because of, you know, some other reason? No, it says, look, Abraham's DNA, the thing that he passed along, if you not necessarily passed along, but that we can look to, that we can claim from him, is not a genetic thing. His DNA is something else. So Galatians 3 says this. To Christians, it says, Understand then, those who have faith are children of Abraham. This great nation that we want to be a part of, and that Abraham was promised, it's not become by being his literal, physical descendants. It's those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture far foresaw that God would justify Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. The gospel, the good news of Jesus, was pronounced in advance to Abraham. All the nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed, along with Abraham, the man of faith. Okay, It goes and it pushes and it points us to faith. Abraham was great not because of anything he did. It was really because of who God was. God chose him, and then he responded in faith. That was the great thing that we can take away from. And that's the reason the nations are blessed through him. It's not based on a family tree, a location, any of it. The great nation that is continuing to be built is the family of faith. All the nations can be recipients of God's blessings if they put their faith in Jesus Christ. That's what we want to be encouraging you this morning to recognize that Jesus isn't just the baby born. He is the culmination of all of God's promises. And if you do have faith in him, share that with people. This season is the best time to do it. Um, people are talking about Christmas. It's one of the most um, easier transitions to talk about Jesus, right? And not just in a Jesus is the reason for the season, which is a nice little slogan, right? But in a, yeah, you know what? I am really looking forward to Christmas. And you know what? Life is hard right now, but I'm anticipating and looking forward to Jesus' second coming. Because honestly, not just the celebration of Christmas Day is one thing, but I know that he's with me throughout that. And so it's a real thing. He's still alive. Those are things that we can and, and, and should be letting others know. And so that's what I want us to be thinking about this week, this month, even beyond that. God's promises are made, they're kept in Jesus, and they're connected to the church, too. And so we thank him for it. I just want to praise him and pray with you this morning. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are alive today. We thank you that you were alive when God made promises to Abraham, and he made covenants promising that you would be uh, blessing the whole world. God, um, it's an amazing thing. We just touch on it. We just can barely grasp pieces of it. But to see that your promises go throughout history, that they can covered all of uh, the Bible's time, and they continue to move forward and continue to apply to us, Lord, I pray that we would embrace that. I pray that you would help us to, um, to celebrate it, to accept it in faith, when our faith is struggling, Lord, help us to depend on you to, to strengthen our faith, that we would be walking in obedience and love and just appreciation for all that you've done for us. Thank you for this this morning. In your name we pray. Amen.